here we are, here for another remote worship service in the house of God we call Third Baptist Church of Chicago. It's a good day. It's a good day because the Lord has gone before us and the Lord has made easy and successful our way. I don't know about you, but it's a good day to bless our God. It's a good day to praise our God. It's a good day to tell our God thank you for all of the good and all of the perfect things that come from heaven. You know what the Bible says, right? The Bible says, what says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Bless his holy name and give the name of the Lord our highest praise, our deepest adoration. I like the way the psalmist said it. The psalmist said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God, and it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise be thankful unto him and bless his holy name for the lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations i dare you third baptist and the people of god to open up your mouth lift up your hands tell the lord thank you thank you for what he did last night for last night wasn't our last night. Thank you for what he's doing right now. For he's making everything all right. For he is God Almighty. And he knows what he we need. For watch this. Paul said, for I know, for we know that all things work together. Hey, uh, for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Thank you for what he's getting ready to do. For eyes have not seen, hey, ears have not heard. It has not even been revealed in the heart of men and women what the Lord has in store for them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Come on, bless the Lord. I dare you to lay your weights aside. I dare you to lay your problems aside. I dare you to lay your trials and your tribulations aside. And lift up your voice and tell the Lord, thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's tell him thank you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sand. Our God is worthy. Hey, he's worthy of our praise. Good morning. My name is Bridget Newson, and I am the Young Adult Team Lead here at Third Baptist Church of Chicago. And I'm here to give you the announcements for this Sunday, November 1st, 2020. Monday through Friday, we have the Manna from Heaven prayer call every morning at 8 a.m. To dial in, please dial 712-770-4010 using access code 618-471-POUND. On Tuesdays, the church receives a message from Pastor entitled, Staying Connected with Pastor Hughes. It is sent out via flock note, so be out on the lookout for that. Every Wednesday, the youth ministry has their quarantine check-ins at 7 p.m. Also on Wednesdays, please join Wednesdays at the Well, our midweek biblical reflection at 7 p.m. You can find this on our church website, the Facebook page, or YouTube channel. Thursday, a COVID-19 update is sent out to the church via flock note and on the church's website. It's full of great information about the virus so please be on the lookout. On Tuesdays and Thursdays during this election time,
please be on the lookout for a powerful message encouraging you to vote. During this Truth to Power campaign, it is our desire that you will see the importance of turning your truth into power. Get out and vote. Every Thursday, we have the church-wide prayer call at 7 p.m. To dial in, please dial 712-770-4010 using access code 618-471-POUND. Every Saturday, the TBOC Food Pantry is open 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. If you're in need, please come down and let us be a blessing to you. Be on the lookout for the next episode of The Stoop, a candid conversation on faith and culture presented by our youth and young adult ministry and led by our youth and young adult pastor, Pierre Keys. We are in the process of producing new content, so be on the lookout. Sunday school is in session every Sunday. Please contact your Sunday school teacher on details how to access the class. Registration is still going on for the Women's Ministries monthly Monday monologue series entitled She, Speak, Help, and Engage. Registration is still going on for the Women's Ministries monthly Monday monologue series She, Speak, Help, and Engage. Our first two monologues were a success. Thank you to all who registered and thank you to the speakers who have blessed us tremendously. The next one will be held Monday, November 23rd, entitled, Take Off the Lashes, Wigs, and Girdles, Depression is Real, Church Hurt and Healing. Our very own Bridget Jones Robinson, Paula Brown, and Shirley Perez will be presenting. If you haven't already registered, please do so today. The schedule and registration forms can be found through Flocknote and on the church's website. If you have any questions, please reach out to Tony C. Gerald, Bridget Jones Robinson, or Reverend Naomi Mitchell. Are you looking for ways to deepen your understanding of God's word? Disciple is the program for you. It's the program of Disciple Bible Study aimed at developing Christian leaders. The different levels of study provide understanding of God's word, emphasizing the wholeness of, a, of the Bible as a revelation of God. If you've already taken Disciple 1, 2, 3, and 4, don't worry, the learning doesn't stop there. We're also offering a Disciple Alumni class entitled Life Interrupted, a Priscilla Schurer Study on Navigating the Unexpected. Registration is now open until November 20th, 2020. Classes begin Monday, November 30th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Register now. Info can be found on the church's website and through the flock note announcement. It is that time of year to celebrate our pastor and our first family's anniversary. Please save the date. The celebration will be held virtually on Sunday, November 8th at 3.30 p.m. God has blessed this church mightily through the leadership of Pastor T.D. Hughes, and we can't wait to celebrate all that God has done through his leadership. He and his family sacrifice daily to ensure that we are able to excel even in the pandemic. So let's show our gratitude for their commitment to excellence. If you'd like to give cards, love offerings, and or gifts to our pastor and first family, they can be dropped off at the church via back entrance given to Minister Marlo Hodges on the following Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. noon, October 27th, October 29th, November 3rd, and the last day being November 5th. We look forward to celebrating with you. My name is Bridget, and these are our announcements for the week. Thank you. What a blessing it is to be able to give to this great God, a God who has made every provision righteously. It is God who gives us everything, and without God, we would have nothing. And I'm blessed to be able to say that over the years, I have watched God bless, move, and do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think or even imagine. This is the kind of God that we serve. One who does not need what we give, but, but calls it obedient to bless him and his church so that his church might bless the people 
and bless the world. Let us pray. God, we thank you today. We thank you that little becomes much when it's in the master's hand. So we place our offerings, our tithes, our gifts in full obedience and submission to you. And we put them in your hands. Knowing God that by your word, you can press them down, shake them together and run them over that they may meet the needs of your people. God, you have called your church to have a prophetic voice and a prophetic witness that brings both truth to power, that calls us to do something about the unrighteous and the injustices of our world. And to do those things, we need resources to have real impact. So we pray, God, that you would send all of the tithes into your house. And then, God, use your house. Use this great church to bless this great world. God, use us to be a beacon of hope and light. That, God, we might bless this community. That when people see us, they see you. And when they see our witness, they witness you. God, we pray for every good, for every perfect thing that comes from heaven. We pray that you would bless the giver and the giver. And if there be any among us who have nothing to give, but a heart filled with desire, and God, you might meet them at their points of need. God, and bless them that they may dip from the running well of your spirit, and they may pull from the countenance of your presence. God, they may be a blessing and receive a blessing from on high. We give your name the glory today. We give your name the honor and we give your name the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen, amen, and amen. And it is so.
join us this day as we bring every care, every concern, every hurt, every pain, every tear, every part of every broken place to God's remote altar. <laughs> you can stand, you can, whatever you need. The Bible says that we ought to always pray. Pray without ceasing. For this great God walks among us. He is both high and low. He is both near and far. He is all over. Won't you come today? Come bearing whatever you need God to take hold of. You can be free today. Let us pray. God, before we ask you, before we ask you for anything, we, we just want to thank you for everything. It's true what your Bible writer described. If it had not been, had not been for you who was on our side, where would we be? And God, the enemy would have swallowed us whole and devoured us. But God, you keep our enemies away and you protect us. God, from dangers seen and unseen. Some of us were in an accident, but God, you saw fit that we did not succumb to death. And then, God, there were dangers around us that we didn't even know were there. But God, because of your hedge of protection and your provision that provides a place for us to have safety in the midst of your care. Thank you. God, we thank you that as we laid last night, no enemy broke in and no fire broke out and no danger sought to take our lives. Thank you. We thank you that as we go about our days, God, you keep us and protect us and hold us close. God, thank you. God, on this All Saints Day Sunday, we remember those who we have loved and we have lost to death. God, our hearts are broken. Our, our eyes cry tears. Our spirits need to be encouraged. Remind us that death for the believer is life everlasting. So God, we pray that their absence no longer hurts us, but helps us. No longer causes us pain, but encourages us. No longer forces us to cry, but gives us joy on the inside. Yeah, God, that gives us peace. To know that God, they have laid down tribulation and picked up peace, yeah. They have laid down corruption and put on incorruptibility. They have laid down the ills and the tribulations of this life and picked up the beauty and the glory of eternal life. God, we pray now that as we are here in this life that you would go before us this day and make easy and successful the way. God, we pray that you would lift up your spirit upon us and make your face to shine upon us and continue to be good to us. God, we pray for this city today. We pray for this uh, state and this nation that we're in. God, we pray for those in Philadelphia who are dealing with social unrest. We pray for those in Milwaukee, Wisconsin today that God, you would go before us and make easy and successful the way. 
God called your church to be a prophetic voice and a prophetic witness to speak to the ills of this land and tell this dying world that there is still a savior. Hey, there is a bomb in Gilead that heals the sin sick soul. That God, that Jesus still lives. That he rose on Sunday, ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father and ever intercedes on our behalf. God, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're getting ready to do. For eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. It has not even been revealed in the heart of men and women what you have in store. For the future is bright. Hey, better days are ahead. Better days are ahead. Better days are ahead. So we tell you thank you. We give your name glory and honor and praise for you and you alone are worthy. Hey, you're worthy. God, we thank you. Hear this. My servant's prayer. We give your name glory. We give your name honor. We give your name praise. We know that you are able to do all things. God, in the mighty majesty, majestic power of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who is the incarnated, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and yet coming King. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What a day, special day and special time. As it is every November year, All Saints Day Sunday, the first Sunday in November, where we give special reflection and celebration to those who have gone on to be with the Lord in the midst of our congregation. We thank God for them. And we are yet praying for every family member, every friend, every acquaintance. They are gone in presence, but still present in spirit. Hear these names. Rosetta Sims, November 2019. Annie Collins, November 2019. Robin Gardner, November 2019. David Lowry, November 2019. Elizabeth Goldston, November 2019. Anthony Manson, November 2019. Hattie McKelpin, December 6, 2019. Minnie King, December 2019. Helen Fisher, January 9th, 2020. Gwendolyn Johnson, January 9th, 2020. Carolyn Barnes, January 22nd, 2020. Joanne McGee, February 12th, 2020. Barbara Somerville, February 12, 2020. Irene Powell, February 14, 2020. Catherine Williams, March 11, 2020. Sam Quinn, March 15, 2020. Lula Mae Grant, March 17, 2020. Mary Brown, March 18th, 2020. Andrew Shaw, March 18th, 2020. Clifton Ross, April 2nd, 2020. Lucy Lewis, 
April 5th, 2020. Bernard Turner, April 15th, 2020. Lillian Townsend, April 16th, 2020. William Hall, April 17th, 2020. Eleanor Taylor, April 23rd, 2020. Candace Walker, April 29th, 2020. Marilyn Fisher, March, May 11th, 2020. Nancy Willis, May 12th, 2020. Rosalind Turner, May 14th, 2020. Naomi Patton, May 19th, 2020. Deacon Clifton Fleming, May 20th, 2020. Mabel Colvin, June 2nd, 2020. Anna Reed, June 6th, 2020. Willa Davis, June 18th, 2020. William McGowan, June 22nd, 2020. Audrey Woods, August 3rd, 2020. Henry Washington, August 5th, 2020. Alfred Ousley, August 10th, 2020. And Mary Witzel, September 21st, 2020. May the Lord be with them. May the Lord be with their families. And may the Lord be with us as we remember them and celebrate them. You are gone with the Lord, but never forgotten. We love you, and there is nothing, nothing you can do about it. God bless you, each and every one of you. Today's scripture will come from Luke 8, verses 40 through 56. Again, Luke 8, verses 40 through 56. I will be reading from the Holman Christian Study Bible. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then, a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter about 12 years old and she was at death's door. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, who had spent all she had on doctors, yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the tassel of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming. You are in, you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly cured. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well, go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house saying, your daughter is dead, don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid, only believe, she will be made well. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning her. But he said, stop crying, for she is not dead, but asleep. They started laughing at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, child get up her spirit returned and she got up at once then he gave orders that she be giving something to eat her parents were astounded but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened and this is the word of god for the people of god
heard the scripture read in Luke chapter 8. You heard the scripture read. I want to preach uh, this day on All Saints Day in the year 2020 of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not what it appears. This is not what it appears. For my young adult crew and my young folks, I guess the best way to say it is, this ain't what it looks like. (laughs) Amen. This is not what it appears. I can admit now as the pastor that every death that happens in our congregation takes but a little piece away from me every time. Every life, every name, every spirit pains me when they are here no more. And I admit that death is one of the things that we cannot humanly understand. It is the hardest part of our faith, and it is the most detrimental part of our humanity. But I am encouraged as I gleam from the words of Luke today that there is more beyond the grave. There is more beyond the shadow of our vision. The writer Luke gives us lenses to look into the fullness of who the Savior is and what he alone is capable of doing in the lives of people. Because there is something unimaginably incredible to encounter this Jesus who makes a difference whenever he walks into a room. Whenever the footsteps of Jesus lands, his imprint changes the dynamic. His presence changes the energetic, vibrant frequency of what is and to what is and can become. From the very beginning of his life to the end of his life, Jesus is a walking, talking miracle who shakes the hand of eternity while kissing uh, the presence of a new day. That's why the Bible says every day with the Lord is a day of thanksgiving. There is something, there is and was a special, unexplainable, combustible experience to be in the presence of this great Savior. That's why John says, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as to the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. There is something special about being in the presence of Jesus. It is something to watch him, something to see him speak and things change, and whenever he touches something uh, that has gone astray, that in which he touches becomes more than it could have ever become without him, because nothing can become the best of something and everything after Jesus puts his hands on it. There is something about being in the presence of Jesus. When we follow the chronological footsteps of Christ, it is easy to see that this Jesus makes a difference. Jesus makes a difference, and Jesus is the difference because nothing can be brought to a final decision until it crosses the fingertips of the Savior. Because that's the saying is true whenever it's stated that it's not over until the Lord says it's over. Why? Because he is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And since he started it, only he can finish it. For who can finish what the Lord started and who can bring to an end what the Lord has closed and ended? 
when we follow the chronological footsteps of Christ, when we collect the miracle working evidence of the master, Jesus leaves behind evidence that he has been present and then he leaves his signature on everything that he touches so that everyone will know that it was him and his work. He leaves his signature, he signs his name that nobody but me I am that I am when he follow in the footsteps of Jesus. No matter where he goes, Jesus changes things for the better. You remember, don't you? You remember when Jesus went to a party. He and his disciples went to a wedding party and they had wine there. They were drinking wine and Jesus shows up to the party. Let me put a pen here for all of you spiritual, deep, and religiously right folks who think too highly of your Christianity, who believe you can't go and be in the places where they party and drink and have a good time. May I argue that nobody ought to be able to party and have a good time like Christian people. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength, and this joy is brought to the fullness when we accept the provisions of the righteousness by grace that reunites us to, so that we can enjoy the presence in and wherever we might be. Whenever God is in the fullness of our joy, we ought to be able to celebrate wherever we are. We ought to be in the life of the party. Some of us haven't got there, haven't we? We haven't learned how to have a party on the inside, but can I tell you that I've learned how to be a party. I've learned to have how to have a party on the inside of me. Whenever and whatever situation I'm in, I've learned how to have a party on the inside of me. That's why Jesus didn't mind going to the party because Jesus was already a walking celebration. And when the celebration was threatened to be over, they ran to Jesus and told him, we're out of wine. And Jesus' first miracle was, let me keep the party going. Jesus then travels. Luke gives this account. He travels to Capernaum and heals an official son. And while he was there in Capernaum, Jesus said, well, since I'm here, I may as well put the whole house in order and there's no sense in me leaving until everything is put into its proper place. And he stopped by the synagogue on the Sabbath day and there was a man possessed with an unclean demonic spirit. And none of the religious folks wanted to help him because it was the Sabbath day. But the Savior decided to touch him because leaving him the way that he found him wouldn't be characteristic of the Savior. Then Jesus stops by Peter's house have a meal and he realizes that Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever and Jesus touches her and heals her and then he leaves evidence that reveals whenever Jesus has been in your house, whenever Jesus comes into your presence and things are not what they ought to be, whenever he leaves your house, your house finally becomes a home. Then Jesus orchestrates a miraculous catch of fish on the lake of the Gennesee because even the fish know how to follow the hand of Jesus. Then Jesus cleanses a man with leprosy. He heals a centurion paralyzed servant. He heals a paralytic who was let down from the, loo, uh, from the roof. He heals a man's withered hand on the Sabbath day. Then Jesus, for the first time, shows the power of his majestic uh, power because for the first time he talks to the wind and calms the sea and calms the storm on the sea and even the disciples who were with him were amazed and they declared what matter man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him then jesus moves to the Decapolis, he cast out demons out of the man into the herd of pigs. Jesus heals a woman in the crowd with an issue of blood. He never even touched her. The Bible says that she touched him. But it proves that wherever Jesus is present, that the presence of Jesus makes a difference. You ought to help me preach this. Has Jesus ever walked into your mess? 
Has, has Jesus ever walked into the messiness of your life? Has Jesus ever walked into a situation that you were rendered powerless to do anything about it? Has Jesus ever been somewhere? Have you ever been somewhere in something that you knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus had just walked in in the room because it just felt different that the burden and the heaviness of the situation seemingly got louder not because it was handled but simply because Jesus walked in and put his hands on your situation. May I tell you, mine, as you celebrate yours, I re remember this vividly. I remember when my wife was on life support in, Lo in Loyola Hospital, and I got down on my knees in the hospital room, and I was praying, and all of a sudden, I felt something. It felt like a, it, was, it was lighter. It felt like a burden had lifted from me. It was heavy and light at the same time. It was light because it was no longer my burden, and it was heavy because I was sitting in the presence of a holy God. Have you ever been in a situation where Jesus walked in and you knew that something was different about the room? You felt like there was a presence in the room that was more power than you could have, that you could handle, and something got better. Something got lighter. Your burden got lighter. Your, your troubles got lighter. Your situation got, became different because, not because you gained strength, because he with all power walked into your messy situation. Here it is. That's what I believe death is now. I, I like you, I, I used to think it was the end. I, I used to, in my adolescence, I didn't understand it. I thought that when uh, the, the funeral was over, when, when we lowered the casket, when we put the dirt, when, when the headstone was placed, I, I, in my adolescent thinking, I thought that that was the end of the road. But now I realize that, that it is an end that leads to a promised beginning and that the Savior is waiting on the other side of death. Here it is. So that we are not trapped, sequestered, shackled in the terrible dilemma of a fatalistic worldview that believes that death is lost and the final breath and totality of God's creation. No, but rather death is the great exchange of how we get the life back that God promised us in the garden of creation. Death is not a withdrawal or an extraction for the believer, but rather death is an exchange. That's why Paul writes in Corinthians, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shell have put on incorruption and this mortal have put on immortality, then shall uh, be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is that sting? Oh, grave, where is that victory? Here it is, death and dying, the grave and the resurrection is Jesus' primary mission and Jesus' business. It was Jesus who conquered the cross. It was Jesus who kissed the sting out of death. It was Jesus who stole the keys from the grave. It was Jesus who took the elevator of eternity and pressed the button of salvation that delivers us from our troubled past to eternal futures that are free from suffering. Today, in the text, Luke gives us some evidence. Luke gives us some primitive proof of the power possessed by the master to do now what he intends to do when he returns. He is going to do it. But he decides in this moment to give us a glimpse, to show us, to show us what is coming, what is on the way, but is also what is and can be right now. Jesus gives us a sneak peek to the promises of glory that we might have hope and future in what is already but not yet come. Look at what Luke gives us. The Bible says that there was a man named Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue that came to meet Jesus and 
fell down at the feet of Jesus and said, Lord, please come to my home because my only daughter is at death's door. And Jesus begins making his way. But while he was on his way, he couldn't help uh, to heal while he was headed to Jairus' house. And the Bible says that Jesus was headed there and she died. Now, can I be honest? Can I be honest? I believe that, that Jesus tarried on purpose. Huh? I, I, I believe that Jesus understood that the plan of God and the purposes of God couldn't be thwarted or hindered by death. In fact, I believe that Jesus wanted death to finish the job so that he could undo whatever death was done, has done. So then, he could prove that since uh, he had the keys that belonged to the grave, that belonged now to him, that he now had the power to unlock the grave and awake the sleep uh, back to life. In other words, Jesus says, I know what this looks like to you, but because of me, this isn't what it appears. And I just want to pause for a moment as I read the list and you're listening to me at home and those of you who have lost loved ones and friends and family members and close loved ones in your time this year. I, I want to remind you that I know this hurts and I know what it looks like. I know what it feels like, but can I tell you, this ain't what it appears. This isn't what it looks like. There is more to the story than you can understand. One of the servants came to Jairus and said, uh, while you were on your way, while you were tarrying, your daughter is now dead. So I tell you what, don't bother the teacher. Don't bother the Lord. There's no reason for him to come now. Now notice, the servant wasn't talking to Jesus. He was talking to Jairus. But Jesus, who was standing at an earshot, heard the servant. And when he heard that the little girl was dead, Jesus' feet started walking. <laughs> Jesus says, now, now that she is, she is dead, that you think, now let's go to, to your house. And he says to, the, to, the, to Jairus, the father, he says, I, I know what he told you, and I know what it sounds like. I know what it appears, and I know what your heart believes, and I know what your eyes have seen, and I know what your mind wants to think. He says, but I tell you what, don't worry and don't be afraid. Can I tell you that no one is afraid of a door that gets locked? No one is afraid of a door closing that gets locked when they have, uh, when they stand on the other side, when they know that they have the key to unlock the door. Jesus told the father, don't, don't worry, don't be afraid, because Jesus was saying, I, I have the key. <laughs> I, I have the key to the door that she now stands behind. May, may I ask you today, may, may I ask you who are listening, who are watching me, why then are we so afraid of a door that Jesus has already given us the copy of the key to? Jesus says, take me, take me to your, your house. And when, when he arrived, the people are grieving. And, and the Bible said that the people are crying and mourning for the little girl. And watch what Jesus says. Jesus says to them, stop, stop crying. He says, stop, stop crying because she's not dead, but she is asleep. Now wait, now wait. Uh, did you catch that? Jesus draws a parenthetic comparison to the dead out of faith and to those who die in him in the faith. Watch what he says again. He says, stop crying for she is not dead, but she is asleep. Here it is. The dead are only for those who die and don't know me, Jesus, the Savior. And there are some people who are dead, but Jesus says, she, her, she's not dead. She's not one of them. Jesus says, she's not dead. She's sleeping. Here it is. Let me remind you that sleep is a temporary state of being. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing that is sleep stays asleep forever. Death and uh, dead uh, might be a final, but, but sleep is a temporary condition that is reversed by a command to wake up by something or somebody. 
Jesus also proves that there is nothing that I am connected to that is dead. Because nothing that is connected to me is beyond my command and beyond my control. You remember what Jesus says uh, to Martha and Mary after Lazarus died. You remember Jesus walks in and they were mourning and crying just like them. And Jesus said, thou shall thy brother live. And Mary said to Jesus, yes, he shall live again in the resurrection. And Jesus says, but, but there, there's one thing that you're missing. Yeah, he will live again in the resurrection. But Jesus turns to her and says, but I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die shall he live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe what I'm saying Jesus tells Jairus stop worrying she's not dead she's dead to you but sleep to me the Bible says that the people heard Jesus' declaration and laughed at him. They heard him say that she was asleep and they laughed at him because they knew that she was dead. Isn't that interesting? They knew the dead more than they knew Jesus. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I don't ever want to get to a place that I know my dead places more than I know the Savior that can save me from every dead place. <laughs> Jesus took the big three, Peter, James, and John, and went in the room and, and, and with the mother and the father and closed the door and when no one could see him. Jesus took her by, by the hand. And I believe him taking her by the hand was a symbol of him symbolically opening the door of death with the key that was in his hand. He tells the little girl, wake up, get up. And the Bible says that immediately her spirit returned. Did you catch that? That her spirit returned. May I conclude? That that command for her to wake up wasn't for her spirit. That that command was for her body. And that when Jesus walked in the room and watched this, when she was lying there, that I believe, I believe that her spirit was already present because wherever he was, her spirit was. And then I must conclude that all of our loved ones uh, who now sleep, that they may be bodily absent, but I believe that their spirits are wherever we are, even right now, because if they are wherever he is and he is wherever they are, then wherever we are together, that they are with us even though we cannot see them. That's what I mean when I say that this isn't what it looks like. Even though with those we have lost, I believe that they are still with us right now. That husbands are back with wives and wives are back with husbands. That mothers and fathers are back with children and children are back with mothers and fathers. Grandfathers and grandmothers are back with grandchildren and grandchildren are back with grandmothers and grandfathers. Aunts and uncles and cousins are back together whenever Jesus is in the room because Jesus holds them in one hand and us in another hand. That's why the Hebrew writer says, he reminds us of this reality. He says, therefore, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us. Let us run with the presence and the preservation, the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, the pioneer, the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning it of his shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endures such opposition from sinners so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't worry and don't be afraid. 
But they are with him. And they are with us. And we are still together. And every now and again, with my brother and my grandmothers and my cousins and aunts and uncles, sometimes I sit with them. Sometimes I talk with them. Sometimes I sup and reason with them. And even when I talk to them, I know that I'm talking to the Lord, and the Lord talks back to me. I like the hymn that says, he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. On All Saints Day in 2020, let me tell you, I want those of you whose hearts are broken, whose eyes are teary, whose spirits are vexed, whose minds are confused, whose hearts are broken, who's, who's having trouble dealing with the loss of a loved one. I dare you to just look up to the sky. Look to the hills for which cometh our help. For all of our help comes from the Lord. And I dare you to Lift up a prayer and, and ask the Lord to allow me to sit with them. Allow me to sup with them and pray with them and talk with them and allow them to talk back to me. Oh, what a day it'll be when we all get together again. And Paul closes Thessalonians with, with this word of encouragement. He says, for we believe that Jesus Christ in the last days will descend from heaven. With the shout of the archangel at the, the playing of the trumpet, he himself shall descend from heaven. And those of us who are dead and sleep in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who are left and remain shall get up and we shall be caught up together. To meet with him in the sky. And there we shall be with our Lord until eternity. Therefore, he says, comfort one another with these words. This is it, what it appears. They are not dead. They are yet in that great cloud of witnesses watching us, hearing us. Every step we take. They are with us, helping us. May the Lord bless you and keep you and wipe every tear from your eye and lift up your bow down head and heal your broken heart and encourage your down spirit. God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. This is it. What it appears. Thank God. Hallelujah. What an awesome privilege and responsibility to be able to stand behind the sacraments of the blood and the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is no small thing, no traditional heritage that we just do with no merit or reason. The Lord instructed his disciples on that last great day they shared a last meal together. He told them to take and eat and to drink. And as often as they would, would do it, he says, do it in remembrance of me. And I think about that night, the Last Supper, as they sat in the upper room, his 12 disciples seated around him, Jesus in the midst of them. 
It makes my heart overwhelmed with joy, with peace, and with honor, and with caution. Because those 12 disciples did not deserve to be there. They did not deserve to be at the table with our Lord, for they had many challenges. Some of them had sins, but Christ looked beyond their faults, Lord have mercy. And the Lord saw their needs, and invited them to sit. And in Jewish tradition, you didn't invite everybody to your table to eat and to sit with one another at the table was a sacred thing. But he called them, all 12 of them, even Judas, he called and they sat. And Jesus told them, take and eat. He said, take the bread for it is my body which is broken for you. And then he after he had given thanks, he broke and ate. And in the same manner, after he had prayed and given thanks over the cup, he told them to take and drink. For this cup was the representation of the New Testament that was found in his blood. As we have come this Saturday to receive communion, I pray that you will join with me and us as we represent these sacraments, this blessed bread and blessed cup together, that we would eat and drink together. Take the bread, which is the Lord's body, broken for us, and eat. And take the cup which is the Lord's blood. And drip from the vein is the New Testament only in his blood. We shall take and drink together. This is the body and the blood of our Lord. We do this in remembrance of him. Until we see each other again, together with him, in heaven, let us continue to drink the cup and eat the bread in remembrance of our Lord, Jesus Christ. God bless you. Amen. Well, we thank God for yet another service for being with us. Another All Saints Day where we celebrate in remembrance of those who are gone but still here. I pray that this message has blessed you to wipe your teary eyes <laughs> and know that God has a plan for each and every one of us. God is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. We open this, the doors of this great church to you today. We offer you Christ. There comes a time, a crossroad in each of our lives when we have to decide whom we will serve. And the Bible is clear that no man, no woman, no boy, no girl can serve two masters. I like the way the prophet said it. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. If that's you today, won't you put your hand in the Lord's hand and, and put your other hand in our hand as we seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness. Won't you choose ye this day the Lord. I know that the Lord can take your life and make brand new your life. I know that the Lord can take broken steps and broken pieces and put you back together again. But that's what the saints are. Just a sinner who's lost his way, who the Lord found and brought us back to him. Won't you choose you this day? Won't you call us, call the churches, that's you. 
773-445-8500 and press extension 238 and say leave a message and say that you want to join us and this great house we don't press you to be members no this isn't about membership it's about fellowship and about discipleship won't you let us come into your life as we serve the Lord together we'll call you pray with you and receive you unto this great house so that where we are you are and where we are together the Lord is and won't the Lord go before us all and make easy successful the way I know he's able know that he's capable believe he's willing thank you today join us amen we'll wait for you pray for you and be beside you as the Lord leads you on now hear these words of benediction now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the throne of grace to the only wise God our Savior be their majesty dominion and power henceforth now and forevermore may the Lord bless you may the Lord keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace and rest God we ask you in the mighty matchless name of Jesus Christ our Savior God go over for us and make easy and successful the way we pray the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit to rest, rule, and abide with this thy people henceforth now and forevermore. Let the people of God say, Amen, Amen, Amen. And it is so. Third Baptist, you know what your pastor is going to say. I love you, and there is nothing you can do about it. God bless you. And God keep you until we meet again. Hallelujah and amen. Yeah.